um, this is our second salon in the this season. And if you um, want to come to the others, if you just go to our website, you'll see all of the other salons that we'll be doing in the in the future as well. So just to say that there is more of this kind of activity happening. So today, um, the salon is around the hidden Cornbrook and Pomona through Wilding. And I'm delighted today to have John and Nick here with us, both from the University of Manchester, who will be talking us through their absolutely fantastic project that they've been doing um, around um, the Cornbrook and in particular the rewilding of Pomona and all of the wonderful stuff that they've they've done around that project, um, which I'm not going to explain because they can do much better than I. Um, so that's all from me, really. I'm going to hand over to our lovely guests. I think we should just give them a lovely round of applause <laughs> just to say thank you for coming and um, I hope you enjoy the session. Thank uh -oh. you everyone. Okay, thanks for coming again. Um, we got together last night just to join together our separate bits of the PowerPoint. So we're going to try and present it as a whole, but you might have to bear with us a little bit if it's um, there's any glitches. Um, so can we just go back one slide? We certainly can. So the, the talk really is in two parts. Um, the Hidden Cornbrook part is social responsibility projects from the University of Manchester to produce a digital map and in that process uh, the Cornbrook which is a culverted watercourse empties out of this area called Pomona and myself and Nick got really interested in that particular space so the second part of the talk is about the things that have occurred to us at, by doing the, the initial project so it's in two parts but it's it's broken down into uh five bits so we're going to introduce ourselves a little bit of background and also um the project um uh, about the cornbrook because not everybody will know about the cornbrook uh about pomona because not everybody will know about pomona and then thinking about that space and rewilding which is sort of the area that nick's much more uh conversant with Mm, we'll find out won't we so i'm going to introduce myself first um so we both work at the university of manchester but i'm the archaeology technician so i do a lot of the logistics uh, around field work students equipment vehicles things like that but i'm also from manchester so i'm obviously interested in the area that i grew up in and that i live in currently um so there's a couple of images on the screen um <clears throat> Cornbrook Street is very close to where I live in Old Trafford. So I was aware of Cornbrook Street. I wasn't really aware of why it was called Cornbrook Street. Cornbrook View, that sign is um, just close to the entrance to Pomona and it's where we take the dog for a walk. So, and married with the dog. <laughs> so we, we're out a lot, we're out regularly. And um, the fourth thing on that slide is that as a archaeology technician I have access to a lot of digital mapping software which means that you can go back in time with the maps so those are some of the elements of my job and myself living in Manchester um, Nick suggested putting this slide in um, because the Cornbrook is a culverted watercourse um, it was once open it's now buried um, and I'd seen these signs around referring to it. And this is my um, route into work, cycle route into work. And as a cyclist, I was intrigued why the cycle lane ran out at a street called Lucy Street on my way into work. And I was intrigued by it, but I didn't really think about it too much. But when I started looking into this as a project, what I realised is that the culverted Cornbrook runs across the road at that point. And the, and the borough boundary between Trafford and Manchester is at that point. And obviously Trafford had paid for the cycle lane. Manchester hadn't yet paid for their bit. But the, the, the point of this slide is really that the open water course actually formed a physical boundary in the landscape originally, which has been reflected. So you can see on the um, photograph, the sign you're entering Manchester. Now you're leaving Trafford, entering Manchester. 
So even though the water course is culverted and it's not obvious, there are clues in the current landscape as to where it runs. Um, that is one of the digital maps, the 1850s map of the same location where you can see the open Cornbrook running across or under the road. Over to Nick. So uh, my name's Nick. I'm also an archaeologist at the University of Manchester. I'm uh, well. We're both actually prehistorians. We we uh, our research is at least partly to do with prehistoric periods of Britain, um, and I also focus on animal bones. So I'm a zoo archaeologist as well. And in particular, I study the periods called the Mesolithic and the Neolithic. So that's from the end of the last ice age through to around about two and a half thousand BC. Um, and I'm quite interested in the relationships between humans and animals and environments in that period. And I do quite a lot of radiocarbon dating and chronological modelling of stuff as well, um, which is all very interesting. But that might make it sound like I've um, come to the wrong place today because <laughs> uh, this is a few thousand years too early. But what I really, you know, what we want to argue today is really that sort of archaeology gives you a particular way of thinking about things. So I'm not going to be talking about the Mesolithic and the Neolithic, but I am going to sort of like think about the way that being an archaeologist and seeing the world as an archaeologist can affect the way that you see all sorts of things, including, um, you know, things today. So we've been kind of thinking about what the difference between history and archaeology is. And and obviously, they're both really interested in writing like narratives of people in the past. So they're very much allied together. Um, but I think the two big things that are different are, first of all, the time span. So prehistory in Britain starts nearly a million years ago. Um, and then the written word and, and written accounts of Britain occurs um, in the late Iron Age into the Roman period when history and historical um, accounts begin. So obviously there's a huge chunk of time that's not covered by written materials. And so instead, we as archeologists have to try and understand people in the past through material remains, the things that people leave behind, the pottery, the stone tools, the metal tools, their architecture. But we're also really interested in, in trying to reconstruct the world that people lived in, the context that people were living in. So we use things like plant remains, seeds, pollen, um, macrofossils, so leaves and twigs and nuts, all the way through to wood. We use animal remains, we use environmental data, we use insects. So we use everything we can to try and understand the world that humans lived in. But that means that we're really not just recreating what humans are up to in the past, we're actually understanding how lots of different living things interacted with each other in the past. And this is where I'm really interested in things. This is what we might describe as a multi-species archaeology. Um, and, and it's all about thinking about how many different living things, including humans, but also our birds and plants and trees and uh, mammals and insects, all interrelate and interact with each other and how they might affect each other. Um, and that's really important for telling stories about humans in the past, because then you get to think about how, where they live, the animals that live there, the plants that live there, actually kind of shape their lives in the past. So that's why I'm quite interested in it. Um, and it, it, it gives us new perspectives on the world. Um, and I think they're perspectives that are equally useful to think about things that we have to deal with today. So... What we're going to do as we go through is we're going to try and use some of these archaeological perspectives to think about Cornbrook and Pomona, because it, it might sound a bit abstracted, but the story of Cornbrook and Pomona is a, a story of changing landscapes, of changing attitudes to nature, um, changing attitudes to industrial and urban landscapes. So if we want to think about how people relate to their changing world, archaeology is an amazing way to think about that over a period of time well we think so um and, and i guess hopefully in the next hour you will be convinced as well so probably the best place to start this story is actually to talk about the cornbrook because i've lived in manchester for over a decade and until john told me about this a couple of years ago the only thing i knew about cornbrook was there was a tram stop called Cornbrook, um, but I knew nothing else. Um, so, John, over okay. to you. So the first thing 
although this project sort of emerged organically, the first thing you tend to do is read around the subject. So a literature review, if you like. And one of the one of the interesting things was about the name, the Cornbrook, that it, according to this uh, English place names book, it was originally called the Crane Brook. So it was, and that uh, Nick informed me in our discussions that cranes disappeared from the English countryside in around about the 1600s. So it has a, a longevity to it that's quite interesting. So if this is correct, that it was originally the Crane Brook, then it's, it's had a cultural significance for a long time. And it was originally an attractive landscape feature. And those are two things that I want to sort of pull out of that name. And to, to illustrate this idea of its attractiveness as a landscape feature, I want to look at three houses um, from the early 1800s that are all on the route of the Cornbrook. So this is a, a modern map. You can see Pooley's house, and I'm sure some people in the audience will be familiar with some of these names. Uh, but Pooley's house is in Hume. It's still standing. Um, and that's the uh, little pin near St. George's and near Cornbrook tram stop. Then we're going to move um, over to the right or to the east um, and look at two houses in Green Haze, which is the area behind the university. One of them is co was called Green Hay. That's been demolished. Uh, but there's another one called the Villas that is still standing, that still visitable, if you like. So, as I said at the beginning, I've got access to a number of different mapping systems, and with those, you can move back in time. I, I, I've reminded myself to tell you this, but a number of these maps are available to the public. So, and this is one of them. So, this is the 1832 Banks map. The university's got a map room, and they've put a lot of their interesting maps online. So, we've got um, if you if you're making notes. If you Google University of Manchester Digital Collections, you'll get access to a number of very interesting early maps of Manchester, this being one of them. So uh, to go back to my point, <coughs> Pooley's house um, is within the red circle. And what you can see is at the bottom of their garden, uh, so um, to the left of the building, yeah, so Nick's pointing to it, is the open, Cornbrook. It was literally the feature at the bottom of their garden. Um, other things of interest on this map are the Pooley's um, mills, which were in front of them. So this is just to the, if you're, if you're driving into Manchester, this is just to the right of Chester Road. Um, and the other thing is the cavalry barracks, which is where the cavalry uh, involved in the Peterloo massacre were based. So there's a lot, and it's now called Barracks Park, if you know that area of Hume. So that's uh, Pooley's house. If we go on to the next map, the 1900s map, what we can see is that now Cornbrook's been culverted. So it's disappeared. It was open, it's now closed. Um, a couple of things to know, the boundary in this instance between Manchester, I think it's Trafford, is still defined by the Cornbrook. Um, and we can also see the terraced housing that's closing in. So before it was more open, now it's becoming more urbanised in relation to the Industrial Revolution. So the second, the second house is this one, Green Hay. Um, it's in the area Green Hayes behind the university, and Green Hayes is named after this house. So the house came first, then the area. Um, it, it was one of the first larger houses built in that area when it was a green space close to the city centre. And it, its claim to fame is it was the childhood home of the writer Thomas de Quincey. So Confessions of an English Opium Eater. But if we look at the map, what we can see, the big, the big red circle shows you the house. Um, and the Cornbrook is, in this instance, running across the front of the house. So it's an open water course integrated into the landscape of these big houses in the 
early 1800s. You can see the bridges. And again, yeah, same map, freely available. So then the 1850s map on the right, we can see that by the 1850s, it's been culverted. So we can see how Manchester's developing, it's uh, becoming urbanized. And these thing, this thing that was an open, attractive feature is becoming a bit of a problem because we have to get on with business. It's being enclosed and built over. The third, the third building, the one that's still extant, is this one, the Villas. Um, if anybody knows the area, it's the one that's opposite, opposite Greenhays Police Station. Um, and on this map, 1845, on the left-hand side, we've got the open Cornbrook, and on the right-hand side, we've got the open Rush Home Brook. Um, the Cornbrook actually runs um, up north, runs to the north on the map. But the key things to know are the location of the house and the location of the two open brooks. This is a slightly later map, but it's at a higher resolution, a higher scale. Um, and the things to, to focus in on are the villas themselves. It's two buildings and they're joined together and they're symmetrical. So the layout is symmetrical. Um, and to the south, what you can see is Rush Home Brook and an open area. Um, is there anything else I need to say on that slide? No, I think that's it. It's an exciting wall, mate. Yeah, so this is what we do for <laughs> hobby slash living. So we went to visit the site uh, with a colleague who's an industrial archaeologist. And what he pointed out was the sandstone blocks at the base are the original perimeter wall. And the subsequent brick um, series uh, were added later. And the reason we're hypothesizing it was a low wall was because it was about the view. When you stand in the house and look out of the very big windows, what you now see is a wall. But what you would have seen before wouldn't have been the wall. It would have been the fields and Rush Home Brook. So, the, and the other thing to note on this photograph is how that wall has been curtailed. And we'll come, come to that in the next slide. So 1900s, um, the villas now, they're no longer symmetrical. The left-hand side, as we're looking at it, has been sliced off because the road's been widened. We've got a tram line in the road. And what was an open Rush Home Brook um, is now got housing on it. So is there anything else? Mm -mm. No. So what we're seeing is the changes to what were once large villas owned by wealthy people who were integrating these open water features into their landscape. As Manchester becomes industrialized, these people move out. Those, pe those buildings may or may not be preserved, but they're surrounded by terraced housing and they become much more functional in nature. So the open water courses are cul culverted. Okay. Yeah. So, as I say, the Villas is still standing and it's now um, the Cornerstone Centre, which is um, a, a centre for homeless people who can go and get something to eat, can go and have a shower, see a dentist, book a doctor's appointment. They've got uh, computers there um, in case they need to do any registration. But the, I suppose the key thing is this, the money for our project came from a social responsibility fund. And part of the reason was that the university literally and metaphorically overlooks this space. They do really important work. And the university is a big organization with a lot of money, but there's no real connection. So part of the reason they gave the money to this project was so we could look at the history of the university, but also the history of buildings like this that have got a really important social function then and because it, it had a number of different social functions, but also now. And uh, this is an issue we'll come back to with Pomona. Yeah, okay. right, okay. So this is just to summarise the, the initial bit. The Cornbrook was originally an open water course and a, an attractive landscape feature. That's what I want to emphasise. And it was characterised by its bird life. It defined the boundaries 
um, between different boroughs, but also the boundaries of these quite large houses, the end of their estate. Um, but by the mid 1800s, as Manchester industrialized, these open water features disappeared. And that gives a really nice, um, those, those three big houses give a really nice kind of vignettes of, of the Cornbrook moving from this open water course all the way through to how it is today as it, as it flows kind of silently under our feet in Manchester, perhaps with people never knowing that they're walking across a stream. But it was, it was these kind of things and your, your general interest with road names and places you walk the dog that actually <laughs> led you... Uh, that led you to to start this project specifically, isn't it? So, could you tell us tell us a bit more about your project? Um... Yeah. So, the social responsibility money was effectively to link together the local history of the areas surrounding the university, so the Green Hayes area, really, but also the university history because it flows underneath the university. And what one of the things that we, emerged over a number of projects is digital technology is really attracted to the university they, they really love students going away with digital skills um, and so the fact that it was linking local history and university history with a digital project meant that they gave us some money to spend on this so um i'm gonna i'm just going to talk a little bit about the digital project because the idea is that you go away and you look at it independently rather than me lead you through it step by step that's not really what this session is about so if you want to have a look at the project if you google uh, a walk along the cornbrook it'll take you to this page which is the social responsibility blog page the reason um we direct you to this first is essentially so we can get some metrics as to how many people are using it whether or not it's being successfully used. Um, it gives a little background to the project. And then as you travel down the page, um, there's a link there that will take you, if we click on it or, or alt tab, to Google Maps. And on Google Maps, what we've done is plotted in a number of these interesting features, like the houses that have talked about. But many other things so are I mean, you okay to pilot it i absolutely am and the amazing thing about this is that um this shows you the full course of the cornbrook which again like even seeing it in various places and spots with the examples you've given mm. so far you still don't always get a real impression of where this flows and and where you might be in manchester where you have it right under your feet so like a very cool thing about this is the fact that you can visualize exactly where this this feature is um and when you were doing this project and going along the course and, and the idea of following the route of a, of a hidden waterway and using that as a as a way to pick out different histories of different places and different stories is really really interesting um so can you give us uh, two or three yeah, like yeah. interesting spots along yeah so it it evolves because, as Nick's suggesting, the things, it's not one coherent history, but it does give us the opportunity to find out some interesting things about different periods. Um, just a little bit of background. We used, um, we used a digital map that's already out there. I think it's called Hidden Manchester. Um, so we used that as a basis. We used the old maps to clarify the water course and through the university section we've got the plans from when the culvert was moved so we've used a number of different sources to get an approximation of the route of the cornbrook through current manchester um there's some really interesting digital stuff online um so the first one i think we we talked about this last night um trinity high school so there's some people might be familiar with Martin Zero, who's traversed some of the uh, Cornbrook culvert from the inside. He's done that relatively recently. Before Martin did it, these two anonymous uh, people produced this report on 28 Days Later, which is a fairly, um, I don't know what the correct term is, but it's 
it's not out there. You have to find it. Underground? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the word I was looking for. Yeah, thank you. So they traversed the culvert a couple of times. And every time they got to a grid, they'd stick the phone out, they'd get a grid reference, and they'd take a photo. So we've been using a digital map, old maps, current plans. But in some points, there's actually a known point where the culvert is definitely under the ground. So we're not relying on street names or boundaries, which could have changed. So this is a photograph of the Trinity High School sixth form that they took sticking the camera out of um, a grid. So I, I find that really fascinating that there's actual locations where you know where it is. And at that point, that's the point that it changes direction and comes under the university. So the link to 28, so the other thing about this digital project is it allows you to put in links so you can chase these up, things up yourself. It's, and that's a, it's a really interesting. Um, and that's that link just there, isn't it? So yeah, if you it click on Trinity High School and then click on that link in the description, that will take you to that 28 mm. days uh, later. And you can read, it's a really long, there must be about 40 or 50 photos in yeah. there of all of the variously creepy stages of the Cornbrook as you go along. Um, the next... Uh, the other, the next item of interest, yeah, the, the wildlife mural. So in Old Trafford, I lived near Cornbrook Street. I had the sign up before. And relatively recently, within the past couple of years, I was working on this project sort of informally. And this mural went up on Cornbrook Street. So I thought, that, wow, that's quite interesting <laughs> because it's, um, it's, is it Heron? It is. Um, so the graffiti artist had signed it so i got in touch with him and he was interested in the fact that he lives in old trafford cornbrook street he found out there was a water course underneath it so he also found it interesting so we we're both in old trafford both looking at the cornbrook independently so he produced this really lovely mur mural on cornbrook street um and it, yeah it's got a heron because he was reimagining the open cornbrook and a flying fish because there's a, a big Caribbean community there. So he used that to represent them. So, yeah, these are the things I found interesting. These coincidences as mm -hmm. was doing it. Um, if we look at Pooley House. This is the Pooley House as it is now from the back. We probably shouldn't have been in the back garden taking this photograph. But... <laughs> it's exploring. Yeah. But the reason this is interesting to me is that my friend that I went to school with, he, he was in Hume, but we both went to school in Chalton. And he nearly fell in the culvert when he was 10 because the culvert collapsed. It was open. And as kids, apparently in the 1970s, this used to be Barrett Park became a park. And this was where the park attendants kept all their equipment and were, so they were obviously in the back doing what they shouldn't have been doing and he nearly <laughs> fell in it so we went back and i interviewed him stood in there somebody else's back garden telling us about when he uh, <laughs> fell in so there's a series of interviews with people who've got interesting stories about the cornbrook from the 1970s in this instance um so that's three examples three disparate examples of the kind of content that i've managed to pile in and the whole idea with this is that it, it, it works on people's phones as well, right? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It, it does work on your phone, but if you look at it at home first on a bigger screen, you get a lot more of the information. On the phone, obviously, it's layered, so it's easy to miss stuff. So probably the ideal way is to have a look at it at home. If you have a look at it at home, it's got a present button. That'll systematically take you through it. It takes you through it the wrong way around. It takes you through it from Pomona backwards. So we didn't want to do that here because we're obviously going the other way. Um, but yeah, that'll take you through each of the points of interest and you can either move on or explore it a little more depending on your, your area of interest. And so, as you mentioned, if we go back to the, uh, let's go back to the presentation. So you mentioned that as we come down the Cornbrook, we start over um, in the east. Yeah, it ends up at Pomona Island on the west, and this is a really, this is kind of where our our sort of interests and research 
um, yeah. intersect. Um, but it's a, it's a place with a really interesting history as well, isn't it, Pomona Island? Yeah, so I said it, I said to Janine and Karen that there's a few caveats in here because I've, I've come at it as I've described. I'm not a local historian um, and I'm not an industrial archaeologist either. But a lot of the information on Pomona, it's got a rich history, but I'd recommend if people are interested in the history of Pomona specifically, um, Hayley Flynn's blog post on Pomona is really good. I got a lot of the information I'm going to talk about, or I got some of the information from there. So if you're interested in Pomona, I'd redirect you to there. I'm going to just talk about the bits that are relevant to this project. Cool. So for people who don't know Pomona or Pomona Island, uh, we've got a uh, Google Images or Google Google yeah it is oh Google Earth in terms mm -hmm. image and it's the bit that Nick's pointing out and it's an island because it's got um, the Manchester Ship Canal to the left and it's got the Bridgewater Canal to the right and it's that bit of land in the middle. Um, it it's, um, creates the bound the the Manchester Ship Canal creates the boundary between Salford on the left and Manchester on the right. And the Cornbrook, which we can't see, but we know runs diagonally across and empties out into the Manchester Ship Canal. That used to create the boundary between Trafford and Manchester. But in the negotiations, the landowners, for, for some reason, the, the boundary has shifted more recently in the 80s, I think. That's the space. Um, my sort of mini history um it was pre previously a docks pomona docks so you can see one of the docks is remaining that little inlet mm -hmm. before that it was pomona orchards and initially uh cornbrook strawberry gardens and pomona was the roman goddess of fruitful abundance so oh here's a map 1850s map of what i assume are the orchards and then this is uh, one of the maps that's available from the university it's really not it's a much bigger map than this i've just chopped it down but that's uh, that area in 1913 and then between the 1980s and the 1990s the so the left one's a 1980s map the right one's 1990s map uh pomona was filled in um it's got a lot of breather pipes if you go and uh, so I'm not sure what they used to fill it in. But... <laughs> Nothing good. Um, is there anything else? Mm. So again, a summary. I like summaries. So I know where I'm up to. So like the Cornbrook, Pomona Island's name refers back to a time when it was an attractive natural feature in the landscape, named after the Roman goddess of fruitful abundance. So Cornbrook was named after a bird. This was named after a fruit. And again, like the route of the Cornbrook, map regression reveals how Pomona Island was built over as part of the developing industrialization in Manchester. So we've got a theme emerging. <clears throat> uh, however, unlike the Cornbrook, since the 1990s, Pomona has effectively been left to its own devices. So we've got something different going on here. So if it's not an orchard or a strawberry gardens or a docks, how do we categorize it now what is it now what is that space so this is this, these were the con this leads into the conversations we've been having and if you go there today it looks like this or or something similar maybe not quite this green because it's only february but so if you go past on the tram when you stop at cornbrook you look over to your left and you'll see an area like this um and it's interesting it's been discussed in various videos and new uh, paper and newspaper articles and words like desolate or wasteland and derelict regularly get used for this area um but what's really interesting is that these words on when we've discussed it these words we realize have got very interesting and weighted connotations and that is that they all relate to this place as uh as being used or not used by humans okay so if it's a wasteland it gives the idea that it's not fulfilling its full potential but that is it's not fulfilling its full potential for for human communities if it's desolate it's empty but it, there re we really mean it's empty of people if it's derelict it's not being looked after it's not being looked after by by humans um 
so Pomona, the way that some people describe it, is very much kind of in it, through a human lens of of like, is it a good place? Is it an important place? Is it a place we can use as humans? Um, and that means that we we kind of it gets characterized as um as like a space in waiting or that it's it's static it's just sat there doing nothing waiting maybe to be turned into something more useful or something that we can do something with um and i kind of want to use an archaeological perspective kind of the stuff i was talking at the start to maybe think about this differently and see whether whether pomona really is this kind of static space of pause that these terms these descriptions um suggest it is or whether whether there are alternative ways to to look at Pomona um and because I'm a, as well as an archaeologist I'm a massive bird watcher um what better place to start not thinking about humans but let's think about birds instead um Pomona has been uh, a place, um, there's, a, there's an amazing list of birds that have been seen at Pomona, thanks to local bird watchers. Many bird watchers have their local patch, which they'll go and, and watch on again and again, and they record all the species that are there. And amazingly, this, this little desolate, derelict place has got 92 different species of birds recorded on it. Um, and these uh, range from those birds that you might expect to see in your garden, so sparrows and blackbirds and song thrushes. Because it's next to the Manchester Ship Canal, you get gulls, you get cormorants, um, uh, geese, you know, those birds associated with the water. Some are year round, some are seasonal. Last time we went there, we saw sand martins nesting in one of the, the crumbling edges of the docks. You know, these are birds that come all the way from Africa and they make Pomona their home every year which is really lovely to see. Um, and I could talk about all of the birds um, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to try not to. Um, I want to focus on two species that are recorded on the, on the list because I think they're really interesting to think about our relationship with Pomona and how Pomona um, and wildlife more generally fits in with our ideas of cities. So we've got the peregrine falcon on the left and the black red star on the right. Now, the peregrine falcon, um, you, you may or may not know, uh, is Britain's largest um, resident falcon. It's also the world's fastest bird. So it's just very glamorous uh, as it is. Um, and when you think of the peregrine falcon, you think of it scything through the sky and taking pigeons on the wing and, and really, and, and maybe you think about them in dramatic places, rugged coastal cliffs, mountainous areas, areas of wilderness where this incredible big falcon uh, can do its thing but uh what's quite interesting is that they live in manchester and and actually they live in loads of cities uh, around the uk because they're adapted to living on cliffs and rugged craggy areas the vertical sides of the buildings in in city centers um the 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 craggy architecture they really like cathedrals and other gothic -y type buildings where there are plenty of places for them to nest quite a lot of pigeons hanging around as well so it's quite quite good for them um so what i what's really lovely is that you know the majesty of these birds is something that you can experience i've seen one waiting for the tram outside the library as it flies over you know they are around um like right almost hiding in plain sight um and so they when we went to Salford keys last we saw a pair of them flying around um perfectly happy in in an urban environment and then we've got the black red star on the right hand side these are a lot less common than peregrine falcons um and i've tried to see black red stars lots of times in my birding life and i've only managed it a couple of times um because there are only about 50 breeding pairs of black red stars in the whole of britain and these are these are isolated to just a few places but one of the places they breed is Manchester city centre, unbelievably. Um, if you go for a walk, late spring, early summer, very early in the morning, around here, around Town Hall and around the Art Gallery, you might hear one singing. Because we uh, last year there were two breeding pairs in Manchester, they had 13 fledglings between them, which, you know, given how few of them there are in the country, is absolutely incredible. And they are species that thrive in urban or could thrive in urban places. 
They first came into Britain in the 1920s, but their population boomed during and after the Second World War, where they lived in the destruction and the rubble of the Blitz. Their numbers went up. Uh, and then a lot of a lot of the individuals that are still in Britain and breeding are in London, but there are a few others in a few places. Manchester is one of the few cities that have them. So these are amazing. These are amazing species to have that live in the cities. So at this point, I've got to ask you, well, how does that relate to Pomona? Yeah, well, um, so the interesting thing is that obviously they live in the cities, but they've been seen at Pomona and Pomona being something just outside the city centre. They clearly um, it's an important place for them. The reason I pick these two species is they, they fit this amazing. They, they fit between the divide between the city and the countryside, you know, birds that you think that you would only get to see out in the wild, in the wilderness. And they're right in there in the city centre. They they. They literally live in the cracks um, of the way that we think about the world like relating to each other. And it shows that they're resilient and it shows that there can be wildlife in urban places. But we also need to think peregrine falcon is an apex predator. It's right at the top of the food chain. The black red star less so, but it's still quite high up there when you think that we're dealing with food webs that start with plants and microbes and bacteria and insects and fungi all the way through insects to birds and mammals. Places like Pomona are vitally important because they they create the space for these kind of food webs to exist. We know that we're seeing massive drops in insect populations and bird populations as a result these species will not even though that they're incredibly resilient and they can live in cities they won't carry on surviving if all of the green space in urban areas is removed because everything else that holds them up in the food web will simply be gone and they will be forced out of the cities um, and already you know the black red star is on the uk's red list and there's hardly any of them um, so these are really important non-human stories to think about um, these spaces. So I, I did, um, I went for a walk relatively recently with a friend who's a grasses expert. <laughs> and um, we, we had a walk around. I think that might be her hand. But I was, <laughs> you know more about plants than I do and she's not here. So <laughs> I'm going to ask you again. I probably fit somewhere in between you two. I wouldn't say I'm a plant expert. I do like plants. There's a thing called plant blindness um, in, in modern Western society. Um, and it, it's basically the idea that we become, well, blind to plants as they're all over the place. They do lots and lots of different things. And yet we kind of don't notice them. Um, and that means that if we don't notice them, we don't notice them when they've gone as well. The amazing thing about going to Pomona is that it is full of plant species. They're absolutely amazing. And as an archaeologist, plants are really interesting because an archaeologist, I deal not with tens of years, but hundreds or thousands of years. It makes me look for those dynamic changes in environments that we might not see every day. So I, I in the periods that I study, I look at the changing composition of trees and forests over the space of thousands of years. And when you look at that bigger scale, when you get to see tree species moving in, plant communities, colonizing areas, you get to see the amazing things they do to spaces. So plants, far from just standing there, not really doing anything, they're actively shaping and creating the world. Um, and what we see at Pomona, we've got willow trees and birch, silver birch, which we would describe as um, pioneer, tree species so these colonize open ground broken ground these are the first tree species that come in after the end of the last ice age and they start they form the basis for our ancient english woodlands and at pomona they're the first species of trees that are setting themselves in these uh, urban like post-industrial places and the amazing thing that's a picture of willow there the amazing thing is the landowners come in and and basically raise all of the uh, vegetation every couple of three or four months in summer and spring yeah i don't i don't know the frequency but it's pretty regular um but what we can see there is that willow what they're basically doing is they're coppicing the willow so chopping the willow down low encouraging it to grow harder and stronger <laughs> and bigger and better and actually they're shaping this environment even more 
Um, so these are really wonderful plant communities. When you go around, you walk around, there are amazing species popping up. Lupins on the left, that's broom on the right, um, um, a close relative of gorse. Hundreds, maybe even thousands of species of plants. It is a true treat. Last time we went, though, the thing that really caught my eye was walking around and there was a glint of purple on the floor um, and I realised it was an orchid. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not perfect with my orchids, but I think this is either a southern or a northern marsh orchid. Um, and then as I thought, wow, this is incredible. Normally I'm out in the peaks looking for, for orchids. You know, they're like the, the top flight of British wildflowers. Um, and then I looked around and there were loads of them. <laughs> 40, 50 of them, like right in the shadow of, um, of the high rise buildings of Manchester. And there are real and, and what we're seeing is this post-industrial place is being transformed by plants and those plants in themselves are creating space for new plants to grow and, and create themselves. Um, so that's like a, a way of thinking about this place, not as static, not as desolate, not as wasted. It's actually incredibly vibrant. It's full of life. It's full of change. It's just not necessarily change at the hands of humans. And that's not to say that there aren't humans there, because there are. Yeah, there? yeah. So when you go, it's, uh, you know, it's there's some really nice photographs of the plants, but there is a lot of stuff as well from it being a docks. But also people live there. Um, and that's that's a photograph of a tent that was there a couple of years ago. and the person's obviously moved on but left the stuff but when we went um under the tram where it's obviously dry it's very well organized and uh, about four years ago there was a whole community of people on the banks of the canal camping so when you walked on the canal there's three or four tents all ranged out as if they were going camping but what what's interesting is this space it it's where it's where the communities who are not really welcome in what we would describe as normal life, end up, mm. and they, they're, um, I mean, it's quite sad, and you know, the the plants and the birds is quite positive spin on it, but it's actually the fact that people are ending up there because it's one of the few places that can get out of the way and just rest, a bit like the Cornerstone Centre earlier on, but obviously much less serviced. So, yeah, yeah, and, and it's they're, they're really we can see Pomona as a place where lots of marginalised communities, both human and non-human, are being pushed. They're being squeezed out of places into these places that are seen as as, as desolate wasteland because that's the only place that they they can be. So I've just put some of the things that annoy me on this slide, um, uh, without intention to offend anybody, um, but. Things like plastic grass, plastic hedges, <laughs> anti-bird netting, anti-homeless spikes. These are all material statements of what we think should and shouldn't fit in our cities and in, our, in the places that we live. And Pomona is everything that these things aren't. Pomona is that space where all of these communities that are being forced out by this kind of stuff, that's where they're going. Um, and, and we're currently dealing with a lot of contemporary issues around social care around biodiversity loss around climate change and these issues really make us think about how we relate to the world around us um and so pomona is is at a fork in in you know in the road um in actually a story that we've already told with the cornbrook because the cornbrook has has been through this flow from being an open water course to being incorporated into a, a, an increasingly urban area to then be covered up and, and shut away entirely. And now Pomona is going through a similar kind of cyclical story where it was post-industrial. It's been, it's now become, well, as described there by Simon Birch as a lifeboat of biodiversity. It's been recolonized by a huge non-human community but we now need to decide what we want to do with places like this. So do we think that development has to be just development for, for human importance? So is it a wasteland? Is it desolate? Or can we actually value these places 
for the non-human elements that are there already you know considering the fact that we all need to live on the planet and the planet needs these non-human communities to survive um and you know this is about manchester histories and we've talked about the history of the cornbrook but it's important to recognize that histories are still being written and the history of pomona is still being written and we we've got a chance to kind of decide what kind of future history of the places like Pomona and other areas, other green spaces in, in urban places, we get a, a, a chance to decide what kind of histories we write for these kind of places. Um, and it's, it's on that kind of slight, well, maybe provocative, maybe not, um, <laughs> note that we kind of wanted to end talking about Cornbrook and Pomona because it feels like it's very, we want it to be forward facing. This is, this is a history that has more to be written and more to be discussed. Great, thank you. Just one, oh, no. <laughs> no, no, yeah, all I wanted to say was that um, when we start, when this project started, I had a really good conversation with a colleague called Anka, and it, this is actually her observation that we've developed into the presentation. So I wanted to acknowledge, A, that where the money came from, University of Manchester Social Responsibility. Um, the invitation to speak so thanks to karen and janine and also to anchor for you know contextualizing it in that way and we've just built on that another round of applause i feel <laughs> just, just for that you get another round of applause um uh, before we, we come up so we just have a few people online asking some questions uh, we're going to go back a little bit so um so one question is, do you have any idea why the cranes left England in the 1600s? What was happening with the landscape in Manchester that made them change their habitat? Uh, um, so I, I can't be certain about this, but a lot of species that we lose in the medieval period, um, some of them get hunted to extinction mm -hmm. um, and taken out. I do know that cranes were apparently very tasty, which is quite unlucky. Um, <laughs> I, I, I hope that I'm not tasty and that means that I can survive. Um, but we also see, um, you, you know, as we get into the later medieval period, middle, later medieval period, changes in land, land management, changes in environments. It starts, um, you know, these processes have happened for hundreds of years where certain species that need niches get pushed out. Um, but I'm pretty sure a lot of them got eaten. Right. It's the sort that. of thing that happens. They have, yeah. So we've got some in um, so common cranes of the breeding in Norfolk and Suffolk again now, and Somerset, yeah, Somerset. So they've been reintroduced and they're starting to to spread again. So we should not eat them. <laughs> See if we can learn. Is there any questions that anyone has here, gentlemen at the back? Yeah, whether they're correct in assuming that it's still possible to actually own uh, the area. <laughs> Yeah, that. You know what's their response? They they have a reputation, don't they? Yeah, they do, and um, we tried to avoid discussing that. <laughs> but when we when we were doing it, we did some films as well. You know that are embedded in the um, the digital model, and I contacted Peel to see if we could trace the route across their space, and they were very polite, but they just refused to access because the building. They didn't want to put us in danger. I mean, if you know the space, it's nowhere near where the root of the corn book is, but it was their polite decline to engage, really. <laughs> I, think <there's> a, <laughs> I think because it's got University of Manchester written on there, we, we sort of avoided that aspect of it. Okay. You can say what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Joe, would you like to ask something? Is the, is the area being considered for uh, special scientific interest, SSSI? And why, why not? Yeah, no, that's a really good question because in a way it'd be great to have a link to a group who were trying to do something about it. But as far as I'm aware, there isn't. And a couple, Simon Birch, his friend, he, he said that there has been um, assessments, but different organisations will produce different results. And so 
Peel Holdings have had an assessment and they've got a particular result. So there's lots of discussion, but I, I don't, yeah, like I say, it'd be great if there was an organisation focused on that area, but I don't know of one. Thank you. Uh, just some comments, really. Um, there's a guy called Alistair McDowell who has written a critically acclaimed play entitled Pomona, um, speculating what goes on under the tarmac. Do you know about that? I, I bought a review of the play from, okay. um, yeah, recently. I've not read it though. <laughs> anyway, just for the reading for anyone that might be interested, sorry, I'd like to like... read it actually. I think there's a question over here. Yeah, sorry. Um, so a, a historical question. Uh, so the, looking at the root of the cool book, uh, uh, I wondered if it had any significance of the boundary in medieval times, because it seems to run uh, very parallel to the uh, Nippo ditch. Uh, and uh, obviously in the early medieval time, this was, was a, a very de defensive uh, 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 issue with Ma Manchester being a, a border town. The Nico Ditch is another story, isn't it? Yeah, um, I, I just, of which I don't know that much. About. <laughs> question on the microphone. Oh, some of the people on the on the um, recording can't quite uh, hear you. Just a question on the microphone. Audience. Yeah, so I think what you're asking is, um, is there any relationship between the route of the Cornbrook that we're observing on here and the route or the role of the Nico Ditch? Um, there's quite a lot of information about the Nico Ditch, and there's another area called Rybank Fields that it's believed it runs through that's undergoing something similar to what's happening at Pomona. Well, there's much more of an active at Rybank Fields. Um, but to get to your question, I don't know an answer to that. I don't know if there's a relationship between the boundaries formed by the Corn Book and the boundary formed by the Nico Ditch. Nico Ditch is humanly made, isn't it? It's not a natural feature. Well, yeah, there's a, there's a number of different explanations for it, but it seems to be a humanly produced boundary um, that runs. I'm not sure of the route. I only know it runs through Platt Fields, and it it seems to also run through Rybank Fields, which is okay. Have you? Okay, so we need to ask you. <laughs> I don't know if it relates to the corn book at all. I think the difference is one's natural and one. Pillows and trees and things and forests, even mm. man made books that are watered. Yeah. So, what's what, the boundary between them? You said Manchester is on a boundary between them. Um, so, the ones I've talked about are Man Manchester and Trafford. Yeah, oh, I thought you meant it's older though. Nico Ditch was like medieval, I think. So. I think that's debated. In England and Danelaw. The English and the in the 10th century. There's a, someone that used to be at Manchester called Mike Neville, and he's excavated parts of it, and he's probably big, perhaps, yeah. good, he we, we, might be a good person to ask Mike to come in. Him. Yeah. We can ask him again to come in and talk about that very I'm sure subject. he'd love to. Yeah. yeah. Um, just a few other things. Um, it's I think it's during the 19th century century there were pleasure gardens at Pomona. Haley Flynn. Sorry, I can't. It's just um just so that the online audience can hear it better through the microphone. Well, I'll yeah. I'll get closer to John. <laughs> <laughs> so John, during the 19th century, there was pleasure gardens at Pomona. It'd be interesting to know um, with some of the plants there as well, the fauna there uh, 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 that were there at that time, or do you know, can you tell us a little bit more about the Pleasure Gardens? With the Pleasure Gardens, the reason I put that Hayley Flynn slide up was because I don't know much about them. Okay. She she discusses it, and there's also somebody at Manchester called Martin Dodge. He sent me a load of information about it. He's in geography. Um, so if anybody's interested, and I don't know if, we could circulate emails there's information but it's i've explained the perspective i've come at it from which is an outsider perspective really um and those areas like nico ditch and like um what's it called pomona 
pleasure gardens pleasure gardens yeah they've yeah. got a whole story you know i'm yes. sure somebody could sit here and talk about that for 40 okay. minutes 50 minutes yeah and the, you've you've mentioned skyliner and also um, one of our other colleagues Maura Gro, she also does guided walks around pomona as well so if you are interested in going and maybe finding out a little bit more then there are walks available that will tell you a little bit more about the history of that particular state and place um i think um, unless there's anything else, there's just one more question there, and then we'll have to wrap yeah. it up. Sorry, it's not a question. It's that Val and I were asking, can we, you know, people were disallowing these galleries for about 20 years ago, um, and it was the upper reaches of the ship canal. We did a, a guided um, ship journey on a barge, but we did lots of research along the bank. Um, on either side, and quite a bit of that was on Pomona. Um, we took lots of photographs of very similar to yours, but 20 years before. Um, mm. I'm going to let you have one of these books if you don't mind. Yeah, 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 yeah that would be amazing. It'd be fantastic. Okay, well, lots of the infrastructure they've put around Pomona, the, uh, the lights and roads, they were crumbling then. Oh really? Sure the lights are still there. The lights seem to be pretty um, uh, favoured places by cormorants yeah. at the moment. So. Uh, and we oh. actually planted a um, very unwild lavender or buttifolia. I don't know if that's still there because it gets raised to the ground like any tree. Oh, should go back and see if we can find it. <laughs> Uh, okay, I think what we can do now is just wind up because we've got our friends online and then we can continue the conversation in a moment after we've said goodbye to our online audiences if, if um, John and Nick don't mind um, staying around we'll get sure. your question then if that's okay. We're just knocking off the online audience. But so thank you online audience for joining us. Um, we hope you enjoyed um, the conversation and the wonderful presentation from, 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 from Nick. Um, and to John. Thank you very much. So, um, if, well, if you want to ask a question, I'll yeah, be here. Just, well, there's two questions really. One was about the uh, the artist's ticket. Is it got they were dormant seats or and they need carried in because it, we've got to come to some. And if they were a lot of the species are sort of reappearing after they've been gone, I guess what does that say about the level of redevelopment and all the iterations and an orchard on this mm. um, and the implications about some future care but also as the rewilding aspect i was thinking of just for clarity i know it doesn't generally work sometimes i was thinking of site three two years ago which was a farm but that man essentially found subsidy rather than drop so he can leave it all to one site but that's quite expensive and as, as far as i'm aware something like peel and so on can't apply for set aside grants in the middle of a city it doesn't those schemes don't exist. So, how do you pay for the real rewilding or leaving to go wild an area that is, you know, that could be the footprints of probably two, three skyscrapers, quite profitable endeavours. So, where does the money come from to leave it green in colour? Mm. If, if, if that's an option, it probably isn't an option. But. Um, <clears throat> so, the orchids thing, uh, I don't know where they've come from. Um, I don't know whether they're dormant um, or whether they've they've blown in. What was interesting is after we left there, I, I I went back a second time and found loads more. But then I walked down the canal and I found them popping up on the edge of the canal as you walk straight into the centre of Manchester. So I suspect they are just around, but they're only growing in those places that are favourable to them. So places that are not getting moan all the time or disturbed all the time or you know and i think it's those it, they were they were in those places those desolate wasteland places as you go along the canal where the towpath diverts up over a bridge where the bit of the the towpath carries on that it doesn't go anywhere nobody goes down there they were growing there you, you know the the bits of the towpath edge that weren't mown because there was a big bollard or something they were in there so I think they they are around. They just they the way that they grow isn't necessarily um, matched with the way that we currently manage these areas. 
Uh, in terms of the second question, I, I couldn't possibly comment as to what Peel Holdings should or shouldn't do with it for well, legal reasons. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I, I think it, it's a recon. We've got to conceive. We've got to maybe reconceive what we mean by value. So you know, at the moment, you know that narrative is all about capitalist money generation. Um, and I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something along the lines of when all the plants have died and all the fish in the sea have died, we'll then realise we can't eat money. Um, and it's the same kind of thing. It, it's at some point we need to make a choice to actually find ways of living with non-human elements of the world in in our lives, not just like out there. We can't just push it out into the middle of nowhere. We've got to incorporate it into our into our um everyday life um and at the moment i think you know modern perceptions of natural things we speak of pests and we speak of weeds and these terms are just describing non-human things that get in our way that, that work against human control or work against you know there is no such thing as a weed that lot it depends on what grows where you does you don't want it to grow they they then become weeds we need to learn ways to get on with these things so we don't have to put astroturf down we can tolerate the other things growing maybe where we didn't tell it to grow i think we there's got to be a bigger conceptual shift of the way that we think about these things when we do that then maybe we can start seeing the value of leaving places like that we can see places being left as green and not entirely managed by humans as being as valuable as giant skyscrapers full of investment properties but that's a you know that's a big issue isn't it and it's the same issue that people are coming up against trying to divest in fossil fuels and things like that you know money sits in places and those and that it sits there for a reason because it's what we normally do and and i think we've got to see big shifts in order to change the way that we do things but um i guess big corporations aren't going to do them on their own so if we feel like it's something that we need to see eventually enough people say that that the change needs to come the change might come okay thank you very much that the thank you thank you everyone for coming we appreciate um you coming along today and it, um we're going to stop now actually if you want to ask come and chat to these guys individually but um we need to stop that's okay <laughs>